Father, we just come before God and we just thank you, Lord, for all the things that you do uh, in our lives on a daily basis. Pray, God, that you would bless the word tonight in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you'd be gentle towards hearts that need tenderness. And I pray that you would be tough on hearts that need toughness. And I pray that your word um, would just would just really um, be fit in the hearts of people here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to land in Colossians chapter 3 tonight. Um, if you have a Bible, you can turn there. I'm going to read uh, a bunch of verses, and then I'm going to probably honestly break down about three or four um, as, we get, as we get cooking here tonight. So Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things... The wrath of coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, size nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, Put in love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now here's the purpose of this whole passage. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him, all right? So if you were to sum up everything I just read, that verse right there, verse 17, is the sum, right? Everything you do should be to the glory of God because that's what you were created for, right? You were designed to give God glory. And I love that it says whatever because sometimes it doesn't feel like, you know, you're doing stuff that doesn't really matter when in reality it actually is because you're a vessel um, that is to give God glory. Now, back up to verse one. If then you were raised with Christ. This is the most important piece for you to get a hold of before you even start to go down the rest of this uh, chapter because it's a, it's a qualifier, right? It's basically saying here, if you've been born again, if you've been saved okay, which raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Now, I'm I'm stopping there because here's the thing. This text is going to mean the most for those of you that have been saved, that have given your life to Christ. Why? Because the rest of the passage is talking about what believers do in order to set their mind on things that are above and to eventually, right, we're going to talk about killing your sin, okay? And here's the thing. If you're not a Christian, the problem is you're going to be putting the cart before the horse in doing this stuff. To be frank, it just gets frustrating, right? I want you to visualize in your mind a person uh, trying to put up a tent, right? But the guy's got no poles, so he just keeps putting up the, you know, the, the tarp and he's setting it up and then he drops it and, and it's not catching anything and it just hits the ground. 
There's no foundation in the things that you're trying to navigate in your life. It's literally the parable of building your house on the sand, right? If you're not rooted in Christ, if you haven't been born again, man, how are you going to navigate these things that are coming at you, right? These pulls in life or sins that keep a tugging at you. How are you going to navigate that outside of like your own like white knuckle going to do it myself, which eventually runs out, right? So, so we go through this, you know, keep in mind that the whole beginning is being saved, is saying that, you know, I've given my life to Christ because I can't redeem myself, right? And then once you, and once you got that, I mean, now, that, now we can talk, Right? So now we can talk about what the rest of this passage is going to open up to, right? Because the whole thing here, and, and this is my last thing on this, if any's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, okay? Behold, all things are now new. So if these things aren't new to you, right, in this the fighting sin and 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 uh, seeking things that are above and not things of the earth, it's just eventually just going to get frustrating because you're not going to be able to accomplish what the text is setting out for you to accomplish. All right? Because look, it's a command. Look what he says here. We're Christ sitting at the right hand. Verse 2, set your mind on things above. Even before that, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand. Then verse 2, set your mind on things above. So what's interesting, I think, about, about Paul here, right, is that when, when you talk about the Christian struggle, right, or struggle life in general, well, I think the easiest thing to do, perhaps, is like we, we get practical. And, and being practical is, is great. And I got a lot of practical stuff that I'm eventually going to get to. But if you start with practical, right, also could run into that same issue as a believer that I was just talking about prior. If you start with like, all right, you know, um, what do I need to do, okay? That could also be something that's gonna, that's gonna get stuck in the mud. Paul is telling you here that you need a particular mindset to accomplish anything in this Christian life. So he says, set your mind. My first thing is like, what is that? What do you mean set your mind, right? So what it's not, I think, is probably helpful to kind of look at first. Setting your mind is not like, all right, so um, my wife likes the house, right? So my, I can walk into my house on like a 95-degree day, and it's 58 when I hit the door, right? Set, no, yeah, right, that's, I don't know. That's not amen. That's me like with the electric bill, and then I'm falling into other sins from there. The, the thing is, setting your mind, you, you can't, you can't set your mind so that when something happens, you're all of a sudden like a robot. You're going to be geared to like react. So when the temperature hits uh, 50, 59, man, my AC will kick on, right? It's set. You don't work like that. Set your mind is an active thing. It's something that you have to continually do. Because I know I'm not the only one here that is prone to not being a spiritual person, right? I know I'm not the only one here. I have to work to make myself think about things above, right? And I think that's something that you really want to understand about this text is that when, when it says set your mind, and you're like, man, my mind's not set. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for me. I'm not feeling very spiritual at 5.30 in the morning when dude cuts me off on the parkway. Okay, well, well, you need to figure out when then you can set your mind so when that does happen, right, it is already there. You don't want to set your mind after something happens because you're just going to get set off, right? You're not going to have your mind set on, right? So, so, so what do we do, right? So, so how do you set your mind? And again, I think it's helpful to talk about what setting your mind is not. Setting your mind is not, it's not positive thoughts. We hear that a lot in our culture, right? Just be positive, man. 
It's like, I just cut my leg off. Be positive about what, right? Just, be, just think good thoughts. And it's like, all right, Peter Pan. So how am I supposed to navigate, you know, my marriage that's now a mess? Are you going to have positive thoughts and then things are just going to work out? No, right? It's also, what it's also not is like, um, I think something that also you always hear is like mind over matter. Just think one way and then that'll work out. No, right? You know what? You have no power inside you to do those things. It's just not in you. Yeah, right? (laughs) You can't, right? Manifesting truth, that's another thing you hear all the time. He bested it. No, he he got lucky with his guests, right? That's not how those things work. That's That's not what happens. Christianity and setting your mind on things above I think, can be broken down to this. I think this is the theme of what I want you to kind of get out of this tonight is Christianity is becoming what you are. And this is why Paul is saying to set your mind on these. When you get saved, you become a new creature. And your tug, your pull back to that old man okay, is you believing and buying to, man, yeah, that, you know, that's me, right? Yeah, that, that's, just, that's just me. Yeah, I get set off. I've got an anger issue or I, I don't have, whatever. Fill in the blank. It's you believing that that is, but it's not, right? We went through that whole list and I'll, and I'll go through it again, but Paul is, is saying here, you're not those things anymore. It doesn't mean you're not gonna fall in them It doesn't mean you're not going to wrestle with them because we don't believe in sinless perfection. You're going to fight. But in order to fight, you got to have the mindset, right? It's like getting in the zone. I I love UFC. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Right now, I would say it's a good thing. I love it. Um, I I just like everything that goes into it, right? The training, the this, that. So when they get in the ring, they're just doing what? They're just reacting, these guys are just reacting, right? Left hook up, right? I know this guy's going to do this. I know this guy's going to try and put me in a rear naked show. Like, they have this all set out because that's what they trained for months. And they step in the ring and they just react. Well, why, why don't you think that's like the Christian life? Isn't it like 90% of the time you just react to stuff? You ever think about why you react the way you react? Like sometimes, and I've talked about anger a lot. I don't know, maybe that's my thing, right? Sometimes things just get me. And I'm like, man, that bothered me so much. And then you start to think back. You don't, I don't look at the symptom, which is the anger. I look at the root. Like what's working in here, right? Where was my mind set prior to, you know, I teach, I teach in high school, prior to this 14-year-old kid saying he didn't turn in his homework, right? Like it's not that big of a deal. Why did I just, you know, black out on this kid, Right? And it's because you forget, or I should forget, you believe you're something that you're not, right? So setting your mind on who you are in Christ is the only way forward in being able to combat these things in your life that are dragging at you or pulling on you. You you follow me? And I think one of the big things about this too is that you want to understand that in setting your mind on things above, setting your mind on Christ, setting your mind on, you know, um, on love, joy, peace, right? The fruits of the Spirit. Setting your mind on these things and believing that you are a new creature, God is for your joy, right? Like the Bible is not a, a, a compilation of rules for you to follow. And then you got Zeus who's just like, oh, he, you know what? He, he didn't read this morning. Pew, that lightning bolt, right? Or like, you know, this, this angry God that's trying to figure out what rule you're going to violate, all right? That, that's literally not the God of the Bible. He's for your joy. And these things that he wants you to do are for your benefit and joy. And, and, the, and the wrestle in the Christian life is allowing the Holy Spirit to make you love the things that you once hated and hate the things that you once loved. 
That's the work. That's the, that's the working of the Holy Spirit. And that's where I kind of rest in the Lord. And, and something I always honestly would get frustrated with is I would, I would hear people say that, and I'd be like, yeah, that sounds awesome, but I have no idea what you're talking about. Like, like you hear that a lot, right? Rest in the Lord. Like, in the Lord. Like, what, what does that actually mean when, I, when I'm talking about this? I'm saying, I've said you 1,500 times. I'll probably say it more. You'll get, it's on tape. So set your mind, set your mind, set your mind. Well, like, how are we navigating that, right? Like, how, how are we doing that? And, there, and there's a couple things I think that, that we can look at in order to accomplish this setting of your mind. Well, first of all, we got to be in the Word. This is how your heart is transformed, right? Be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. That's literally what this is saying. Set your mind. Well, what's going to happen? If you set your mind on spiritual things, you think about what you are in Christ, you're going to be formed. Now, some of us may grow in a, a leap. Some of us may grow in a bound. Some of us may grow in a snail's pace. But man, if you're growing, if you see little things change, that's what the walk is about. And it doesn't just happen, right? There is work in the believer to be done to accomplish these things. And it's, it's the gospel, right? You set your mind on what Christ has done for you. I feel like as believers, you, we treat the gospel, and it is, as, all right, the gospel is going to get people saved, obviously. Right? Yes. But like, when you leave it there, and then as a believer, you try and navigate the Christian life without going back to that you have someone that died in your place, that substituted himself for you, right? That took on God's wrath so that you don't have to bear that if you believe upon him. Like when you as a believer get a hold of that, the setting your mind thing becomes a little bit more normal, right? Like, I love my wife now more than I did when we got married, right? I think she would say the same about me. I don't know um, because it's tough to live with me, granted. But I love her now more. Why? Because I get to know her more. I see things of her that I didn't maybe see earlier. I'm like, wow, that's amazing, right? She's great with kids. I'm not going to make this whole thing about my wife. But the thing is, right, you do that with Christ, and you do that with the gospel. Go back and look at the gospel. It's not just like step one in theology. It's like, yeah, no, I got the gospel. No, man, I, you go back to that every day. That's what you're setting your mind on, what has been done for you. Quick example. Someone saved your life, like here and now, right? Like someone walks out this door, and you're, they're not paying attention, and a van comes flying around the corner, and someone just pushes you out of the way and they take the hit for the, uh, on the van, you're looking at that guy or girl and being like, I owe that person my life, right? There's like an instant connection there almost. Like, what can I do, right? But I love that this person gave up there. I mean, how much more with Christ who, who was like, yeah, that guy should get hit by the van, Right? He's looking at you, right? You deserve the wrath of God. And he says, no, no, I got this. Step in your place, right? And takes on the wrath for you, right? There's a, there's a love that's gonna grow there. You continue to look at and appreciate the gospel for what it is. It's a substitution for you, personal, okay? Verse five, I'm gonna jump down to verse five. Therefore, Put to death your members which are on the earth. There's so much Christian literature on what's also, like, so putting to death, another word that they use is fortify. That word sounds a little bit like more ferocious, but it literally means to put to death. You are in a fight with yourself. That is the Christian walk, right? You're literally wrestling against yourself. And that's so difficult because you know your enemy so well, right, essentially, because it's you, but they also know you really well, right? So it's like this ultimate game of chess. With your and so 
when you're, when you're wrestling this and putting it to death, you're doing it to yourself. I mean, that's like literally impossible. It's like the, it's like the, the immovable you know, object meets, meets unstoppable force, right? And the thing is, when we set our minds, it becomes achievable in small doses or big doses to actually put your sin to death. Now, what does it mean to do that? When I say I want you to kill your sin daily, like what does that actually mean? Well, it's a couple things. Um, first, it's important to understand how, how sin works. I, I got a clock, so don't worry. Sin, right, and, there's, and, and over, over the course of Christian history, there's a lot of great um, quotes about sin, obviously, and things like that. This, this quote is, is amazing to me. Sin unto your heart and entangles your heart with its affections, right? When you, when you look at sin like something that is trying to daily destroy you, you either are gonna get in the fight and fight against it or you're gonna die. It will kill you. One of the greatest quotes that I've ever read is, be killing sin or sin will kill you. Right? And I'm looking around, I see maybe some of you got into a scrap, right, here and there, maybe in your younger days, whatever. And here's the thing, like, can you imagine getting into a fight and just being like, oh man, this guy's just me to death, I'm just gonna let it go. No, man, you're gonna do something, you're either gonna cover up, right? Maybe you're gonna, I'm, I'm always back to UFC, what is this? Right? But you're gonna cover up, you're gonna block, you're gonna, you're gonna do something. Well, again, why don't you view Christian life like that? It's a warfare. If you, and here's the thing, there's grace, when you're not setting your mind and when, and when you're not, you know, maybe, got, maybe you didn't get in the Bible today or maybe you didn't pray, there's grace there from the Lord, absolutely. But here's the thing, that's like not loading up your gun when you go out to war. That's like walking into the octagon without training. You're gonna, you're gonna get wrecked, right? And so, you know, when we look at killing your sin, it's gotta be something that you're thinking about. You can't just be like, that's a spiritual thing. Yeah. Figure it out. No. You, the thing about this, about this world, then, they separate the two, right? Spiritual life, regular life. And we, and we deal with them like this. The Bible does not make that distinction, right? I mean, we, we, you're in a spiritual battle, like right now. As I'm preaching this. You're prob- you could be thinking about something way over here. That's spiritual. Or we're talking about, I'm talking about the Bible, we're talking about the Word, we're talking about how to kill your sin. If your mind's wandering, that's a spiritual thing. Folks, right? The Christian mortifies sin because he's at peace with God. And the legalist, or someone that wants to follow rules, mortifies sin to try and peace with God. The big difference there. You will be able to kill your sin if your joy is rooted in the gospel and how you set your mind on things above, all right? I want to end with, with these two things, a little practical, and then I'll give you uh, some, some things that we can break out into groups and talk about, okay? Um, here's the thing. So how do you kill your sin? Now, Paul, Paul kind of gives us the obvious here in verse 12. Therefore, right, so you hear all this stuff, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on, so here you go, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meek, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against one another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Those things right there, focusing on those things, doing those things, forgiving people, being kind, right? That is literally putting your sin to death. Why? Because the root, right, of what your sin and what your flesh is trying to do is rooted in self-centeredness. What's best for me, right? That's our culture, isn't it? Like, hey man, do you. Whatever you feel, just do it. What? Right? Like, you're saying that to people you don't really know, which is a little alarming. All right, but it's like, we, you don't want to live like that because you think it's going to bring you joy and you think it's gonna bring you victory, 
but it brings you the opposite. Self-centered thing, right, is rooted in sin and death, right? It doesn't do anything for you. And so putting on these things that Paul mentions here is exactly how you put that lifestyle death. Now, granted, the way that I'm speaking about these things, you need to put it in the context of a lifetime. You're gonna wrestle with sin till you die, period. Some things you'll, you'll conquer and they won't be as big of a deal anymore, but guess what? It's like whack-a-mole. You nail one, something else is gonna pop up. But here's the thing, as the, life, as the Christian life moves on, man, you get to wield that thing a little bit better, or at least you should. That mole's not gonna sit there for years sometimes. In the past, maybe it did, right? By the end of your Christian life, you should be nailing those things as they pop up, right? Or at least be aware, like, hey, I hit this one. I know myself, that one up in the corner's gonna up, right? That's the daily living. So when something goes by the wayside, man, don't think it's dead. It's gonna, how many times that happened to you? You thought something was done and that thing comes back and you're like, oh my goodness, get rid of this thing. And then you start to trickle into, maybe I'm not a believer, right? I mean, I know we've all been there. I mean, I was there like, like two weeks ago, right? Thing. Don't get defeated by morally neutral things that can destroy you. Let me explain to you what I mean. Morally neutral things. I got three kids now. There should have been a... I'm not playing. Three kids now. And here's the thing. Um, and I heard a, a pastor say this once, and it's spot on. If I don't beat my kids up in the morning, right, I lose. I'm not getting in the word. I'm not going to have that time to pray. And I'm going to be in trouble, right? You know why? And, cause, and, and I'm just like, I, and I can tell you, it's happened before. I'm sure it's happened to you. You're like, yeah, I didn't get to read. Not a big deal. All of a sudden, I'm short with, I mean, I'm short, but like short-tempered with my kids, snippy with my wife, man, you burnt that steak. I wanted it medium. It's like, right? Like stupid stuff, right? Why? Well, because a morally neutral thing taught me, which was that I should have set my clock in the morning to get up earlier. I shouldn't have been up watching TV so late. Those, those are morally neutral things that snipe you and get you to do something that actually makes you eventually fall into sin right? Are there certain songs you shouldn't listen to? Are there certain things that you shouldn't watch, right? Even if those things, maybe some of those things are more moral, but on the moral neutral ground, like what are the little things that are, are, are getting you that eventually lead to you not being able to set your mind, get your heart centered, and then go out and conquer sin? Right? So those, those, are, those are two things I want you to, to talk about in the, in the breakout groups. Two questions. How has your view of yourself impacted how you... How has your view of yourself impacted how you act? And the second thing is that you can share or talk, think through, like what morally neutral things you do in your life that can help you fight against sin, all right? And you can't steal mine and be like, I need to wake up earlier. No, you can, you can, that's fair. Um, but I want you to think about those two things and we'll break up in, oops, want me to uh, pray or? All right. Father, we just come before you, Lord, and we um, just thank you, Lord. I thank you for uh, these people that have gathered here tonight. And just, we praise you for your word. Uh, we, we ask God that you do a work in us that you help us. You know the things that we all struggle with, whether they are seek in secret, whether they are in public, whether we confess them to others or keep them between ourselves. Lord, you know. I pray, God, that you would work in us just a, a great work. I pray that you'd you know, continue to help us produce fruit. And Lord, I pray um, for those, Lord, that aren't sure you know, if they know you or if they don't know you. I pray that you would touch that heart tonight, Lord. Bless us, bless us in our time here. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.